Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the All Me Podcast. This is Don Hooten Jr., and today I'll be your host. Many people have no idea that there was a book written about my younger brother, Taylor. Prior to meeting the book's author, Bill Cachetis, who will be our guest today, I had never been a part of any book ever published. It was an experience I'll never forget. Appearance and performance enhancing drugs, specifically anabolic steroids, provide a tempting competitive advantage for amateur baseball players. But this shortcut can exact a fatal cost on talented athletes. In his urgent book, Suicide Squeeze, William Cachetis chronicles the experiences of Taylor Hooten and Rob Garibaldi, two promising high school baseball players who abuse these drugs in hopes of attracting professional scouts and Division I recruiters. However, as a result of their steroid abuse, they ended up taking their own lives. In Suicide Squeeze, named for the high-risk play in baseball to steal home, Cachetis identifies the symptoms and dangers of steroid use amongst teens. Using archival research and interviews with the Hooten and Garibaldi families, he explores the lives and deaths of these two young men, the impact of their suicides on Major League Baseball, and the ongoing fight against adolescent appearance and performance enhancing drug use by their parents. A passionate appeal to prevent additional senseless deaths by athletes, Suicide Squeeze is an important contribution to debates on youth and sports and on public policy. Thank you for tuning in today to listen to my conversation with Bill, who wrote one of the most important books to myself, my family, and the Taylor Hooten Foundation. Let's go ahead and talk with Bill Cachetis. Bill Cachetis, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thanks, Donald. Great to be here. Yeah, this is great. I'm so excited to talk to you. It's been a while since we've had a chance to visit. I've known you for many years, and we've developed quite a relationship that we're going to talk about in this podcast. But I want people really to understand who you are and what you're all about. So, Bill, if we could start just talking about you know, where you grew up and what interests did you have as a young man? I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia and being surrounded really by early American history as, as a kid, I developed a, a real passion for, for history. Going through the, the Quaker school systems, you can't help but uh, be schooled in buildings that date to the 18th century and, and places where William Penn and and Lucretia Mott and big names in American history had visited or uh, had had been. So the the interest in history really developed from really my roots in in Philadelphia. But long about 1964, I developed this passion for baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the year that the Philadelphia Phillies, my hometown team. <laughs> We're in first place by six and a half games with 12 left to go. They lost 10 in a row, blew oh. the pennant, and broke the hearts of every kid and every adult <laughs> male in the city of Philadelphia. And that begins my love affair with baseball and specifically the Philadelphia Phillies. And that scene, you know, from, from growing up, in Pennsylvania, I know there are no more passionate fans than Philadelphia sports fans, period. I will argue that with anyone. But uh, I, I know what, regardless of whether your teams are winning or losing, fans always stick behind them. Absolutely. Philadelphia fans, no question, are, are very, very demanding. We are the kind of fans – that love to see our players get dirty. We like to see them emote, throw a batting helmet, yell at the umpire. We can relate with that because yeah. we are a working class city. The On the other street hand, bullies, right? I mean, you've got the hockey team there too. You know, growing that's up, where it watching, started. Oh yeah, that's where it started. Seven, 74, 75. 
uh, we were championship starved. We hadn't won anything since 1960 when the Eagles took, you know, the NFL uh, championship. It, it, that was pre Super Bowl. And here come the Flyers in a sport that had only existed a handful of years by 1975, and they win back to back cups. Yeah. And everybody was a hockey fan. We were just so starved, and they were our style. They were, they were the team that fought the most in the NHL, and people just loved them. I grew up a big hockey fan, and you know, people ask me, living in Dallas, are you a Stars fan? Yeah, sure, I love the Dallas Stars, but I grew up loving the Philadelphia Flyers. That was the days of uh, Rick Tockett and Ron Hextall. I mean, you remember those days. I mean, it was it was awesome to watch. Obviously, it's such a fun sport to be a part of, too. It is. And most of those guys, unlike the other former professional athletes we've had in Philadelphia, the Flyers, more than any other organization, their players, at, long after they retire, they are still in the Philadelphia area probably the second uh, most former pro athletes we have living in the Philadelphia area are the Eagles, but the Flyers, they're beloved uh, yeah. from those days. And you probably remember my cousin, Bert Hooten, that pitched with the Dodgers. I know he was a, a Philly killer is what they would call him back in the day, uh, you know, but d did some damage to the Phillies in, in the postseason games. Absolutely. I remember Bert Hooten very well. We booed him <laughs> off the, uh, oh, the mound yes. and, uh, Game, I guess it was game two of the 1977 NLCS. Yes. And the Dodgers came back to bite us and uh, went on to capture the pennant. But, yes, I do remember him I very well. I had completely well. forgotten about that. I mean, that, that would just be a, a pitcher's nightmare to show up. I guess would have been the time Veterans Stadium. That's and right. Just having all those fans booing you. It's like, how do you stay focused to throw a pitch? He must have felt like a Christian being fed to the lions in the Roman Coliseum <laughs> that day. <laughs> Fans really got into it at his expense. Exactly. Yeah, probably something he doesn't want to go back and relive. But yep. what I, I want to kind of move forward because you have quite an education. Obviously, you're an extremely brilliant person. Uh, you know, you, you get your undergrad degree from Ulam College. Then you go on and get your Master's of the Arts at Brown University. Then you go on and get your Ph.D. at the University of Pennsylvania, which, again, are all prestigious schools, Ivy League schools. You know, following your degrees, what was next for you in life? Well, I, I don't know about the, the brilliant part, Donald. I think getting a Ph.D. is more blood, sweat, and tears than it is brains. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's a lot more stupidity. But, yes, I, I was very fortunate to get scholarships uh, to go to those places. And I met people who played very influential uh, role. In, in, in my life. Um, many of them have now passed, but uh, the few that are still around, I still stay in, in touch with. But yes, the, my education shaped largely the way I look at history, the, uh, the way I write it, and, and the way I teach it. And unquestionably, those schools were my proving ground. So, I mean, when you get out of school, or, or is it something that you found passionate? You, you wanted to start writing when, you know, as soon as you get out of school, or is it something, you know, you felt that, hey, I need to go and, and, and I want to teach? You know, tell us sort of about, you know, what you were feeling as, a, you know, a young man, obviously at that time. Uh, but, you know, going in with, with this great education you have and this passion for, for history, you know, going in to teach other people. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I, my dream. <laughs> when I got out of college was to return to Quaker education and become a headmaster of a Philadelphia Quaker school. And for a whole lot of reasons that just didn't happen. Uh, when I graduated from Earlham in 1981, my academic advisor there, a very dear friend who uh, passed not long ago, uh, strongly suggested that I do a, a master's degree because if I was going to throw my lot in with independent education, that uh, a master's degree would give me more flexibility, it would give me more job opportunities, it would give me higher pay. And if in the event that I, I did the master's degree in history and I liked it, I could always go on to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, 
I did that. He he did get me a a fellowship to go to Brown University, and I I really enjoyed it. I was working with Gordon Wood, uh, who is who wrote the seminal book on the creation of the uh, the American Republic in the United States Constitution, mm-hmm. and I really struggled to determine if if I should stay in and get the PhD at that point. But again, my heart still belonged with high school students. I felt that I could do the most with them because I had done a, a lot of camp cal- baseball camp counseling. I took an internship when I was in college and I taught at the high school level. And I really, really liked the challenge of those high school kids because they are at once oh. <laughs> the most sensitive and at the same time, most insensitive yep. creatures you will ever meet. <laughs> Uh, but you really are, you know, you are dealing with, uh, you're dealing with a psychology there that is, is wonderfully challenging. Uh, and I wanted to do that. So I finished up the masters at Brown and I went into the Quaker schools, started to write history, Mm -hmm. published a couple books on the Quakers in history. And all of a sudden I'm getting raked in the reviews. (laughs) <laughs> this is ridiculous. I, I I don't need this punishment. And I'm not making any money writing these books anyway. They're for a small, a small, very proprietary audience. So I took a shot at baseball writing. I was passionate about baseball. I was coaching baseball. And I had a wonderful topic uh, in the one-armed wonder, Pete Gray, who played for the 1945 St. Louis Browns. He was a family friend. So I wrote about him. And all of a sudden, my writing just took off. Here, I'm not only am I getting positive reviews in the newspapers and in journals, but I'm getting paid for it too. <laughs> Even so, better. oh, absolutely. So, you know, I I became a writer, and the longer that uh, I stayed in Quaker education, the less attractive administration became to me. Uh, private schools don't pay very well, so I realized that if I wasn't going to be an administrator. I had to move on to the college level. I was working on my PhD as I was teaching in the private schools. Mm -hmm. So when I got the PhD, I left. I went to college teaching, first at Penn, then at Westchester University. Mm -hmm. And and as, as life's twists and turns occurred, I ended up in a community college in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, And by that time, I I would have to admit that I saw myself more as a writer than a teacher because all my spare time, all my spare time, aside from coaching and raising my sons, was invested in writing. And, you know, I don't care what it is. I've written close to 30 books now. They're biography. Uh, Some are with historical figures. Many are of baseball players, but I cut across the spectrum. And that's the nice thing about teaching in a community college. You're not pigeonholed into writing about your one little area. And if I had done that, my PhD was in colonial and revolutionary America. I haven't written anything in those fields since I got my, my degree. I've written mostly 19th century history and 20th century baseball. Um, So, you know, I guess I made a virtue out of a necessity and became a writer. I think you're a tremendous writer. I've never been really, I, I've never had a relationship with an author. And I remember my dad speaking very highly of you and you had approached our family about, you know, writing a book about Taylor. And that, that's what I want to talk about next is just a, a book that you've written that's very, very special to myself. It's very special to our family. And the title of the book is Suicide Squeeze, Taylor Hooten, Rob Garibaldi, and the Fight Against Teenage Steroid Abuse. And it was published in January of 2017. I want to go back, Bill. Like, when when did you learn about my brother Taylor's story? What got you interested in writing this book about Taylor and Rob and anabolic steroids? I was working on a book about the 1993 Phillies at the time, and that was a juice team. There were people led by Lenny Dykstra, Mm -hmm. who was the leadoff hitter and the star outfielder for that 93 Phillies team, who were juicing. It was very clear. 
when the Mitchell report came out, those names came out too. And really uh, the major players, the six top players on that team, many of them were using steroids. And at the same time, I was coaching baseball. I was coaching high school students and my son was, was uh, playing on my tournament team. And the whole reason I had the tournament team was because he had played for another tournament team Mm -hmm. before I started mine. And that tournament team coach was encouraging the players to take supplements, 25% of which we know contain steroids or steroid precursors like andro and creatine. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I flipped, I absolutely flipped. And as I was doing the research and, and watching my son's tournament team play, and they were 15 year old kids Mm -hmm. who were coming up against other 15, 16 year old kids who look like 22 year old kids. They're (laughs) built. And I'm saying to myself, are we in the wrong bracket here? Yeah. What's going on? What's going on? And then I'd notice, particularly with the pitchers, if they'd give up runs, they'd go into a rage. Mm. You know, these were, these were teams basically where we were playing from, uh, from Florida or they'd come in from California because we played mostly up and down the East Coast. But they, could, they couldn't control themselves. And I'm saying, what's going on here? And I'd ask, you know, the, uh, the other coach, and I'd always get a wink and a smile. Oh, weightlifting. Oh, oh, vitamins, you know, whatever yeah. else. And at the same time, I'm doing this research, and I ran across Mark Fainaruwada, uh, his coverage of what was going on uh, in San Francisco with Barry Bonds. And then, yeah. of course, he wrote the book Game of Shadows. Yeah. And he, in that book, he, he mentions Taylor and Rob Garibaldi. And of course, then in in 2005, there was the uh, congressional hearings on steroids in Major League Baseball, and and your father Don and Denise Garibaldi, uh, Rob Garibaldi's uh, uh, mother, were the opening testimonies in 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 those hearings, and I was glued, and my heart just broke for 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 Don and and for Denise listening to those situations. And I got my hands on anything that I could get, uh, anything that was written about Taylor or Rob in the national media, uh, in, in, in local media in Texas or in the, in the San Francisco area where Rob was from. And the more I read about it, the more angry I got. And, you know, then I just, I, I contacted Don and I said, look, I, you know, I might not have any business in this. And I realize I'm being very intrusive, but I'd really like to do some writing about Taylor. Mm-hmm. And I, I did the same thing with Denise Garibaldi. I mean, you know, baseball is, is, is my passion and my kid, you know, kids, kids in general and high school kids in particular, you know, come a very close second. And I, I was, ve- and I was seeing this happen. And, and I, I wanted to write about it. I was very concerned. And I was so very fortunate that they trusted me. Mm-hmm. Because when you do a book like this, this is not history. Yeah. You know, in history, you're dealing with a lot of dead people. You <laughs> exactly. don't have to worry yeah. about breaking feelings. Yeah, hurting their, right? family, or, yeah, hurting their family's feelings about something you wrote about them. But I, I could not go anywhere unless I had the complete trust of your family Mm. and of the Garibaldi family. And I was so fortunate that both of, of, of the families gave me their complete trust. And it was, I, I went on a journey with them. I know that it was painful, very painful for the members of the family. Uh, there were times where, particularly when I spoke with Gwen and Denise, we had to stop mm. the interview. Yeah. And I, I, I respected that. Yep. Um, and, it, because of that, it took a lot longer to write this book than anything else I'd ever written. It was, without a doubt, the most emotionally challenging book that I've ever written. And I remember sitting at the word processor with tears streaming down my eyes, <laughs> writing about 
uh, down my cheeks writing about these young men yeah. and what had happened. And what was so tragic to me is that both Taylor and Rob were good, yeah. all American kids. Yeah. They, they had good grades. They had friends. They were popular. They were athletic. They had a wonderful future. And how many people know this, but Taylor had a, uh, I think, a, I think a really good future as a, as, as a writer and as somewhat of a comedic writer, if he hey, wanted yes. to. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and he had a lot of talent, a lot of talent. And then to see what steroids did to him and to Rob that they were a shell of themselves by the time they took their lives. It was just so tragic. And then to follow up and, and, and hear all the garbage that Don and Denise had to take for trying oh, to bring yeah. this issue to the foreground when they were trying to help other people and they're getting nothing but resistance from the very people that should have been helping them exactly. specifically schools yes. principals teachers coaches and even other parents we got lots of pushback and and for those who are listening who have never been a part of writing a book or uh writing is definitely not my forte but bill one of the memories i'll never forget for the rest of my life is my dad called me and he said, you're going to be in Philadelphia uh, for the Professional Baseball Athletic Trainers Play Program. And there's going to be a gentleman that would like to join you. He's a baseball coach. He's writing a book about Taylor. He's a great guy. You're going to love him. His name's Bill Cachetis. And I said, great. You know, have him come along. He can see the program. And, and I remember after you said, let's go grab a bite to eat. I believe it was at McFadden's at Citizens Bank Park. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I was like, okay, th this will be, I've never, never been a part of something like this to help write a book. And I just remember sitting down with you, you were doing your job and asking the questions, which were very difficult questions, but you were doing that to, to put the book together, have the details and all, all the stories. And, and I'll never forget um, that day. It wasn't easy. I'm, I'm so glad we did it because one, you're a tremendous writer, but two, the book is so well written. It's easy to read. I, I actually read the book when it first came out on a flight. Uh, we had to go to New York for the day. So from Dallas, Fort Worth to LaGuardia and back, I read the book cover to cover. Uh, but I'll never forget, we left McFadden's and I believe I had a rental car. I did. I had a rental car and I was heading back to our friend's house that we were staying with. And I picked up the phone and I called my wife. I'm on the highway. I am like bawling in tears. And she's like, what is wrong? I said, I just, it, it was, it was like a great, one of the greatest therapy sessions I've ever been through, but it brings all those things back out. And the more you can do that, and people still ask today, how are you able to share your brother's story in front of a group of strangers? I said, it's, it's therapeutic. People need to hear the story. And as a writer, I couldn't imagine, and an author, how hard it would be to put together a book like this. Cause it wasn't just me that you talked to. You had to talk to my dad. Like you had to talk to my mom. You had to talk to, to Rob's family. And uh, you know, so I, I just wanted to tell you how much it meant to me and you know, how easy it was to talk with you and uh, just what a wonderful job you did of putting the final piece together on the stories about Rob and Taylor. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. You know, when you, when you're a historian and you write historical biography, you end up living in, in the mind of the person that you're writing about because you, you read everything that they've written, if they have written anything. Uh, you read what others have written about them. Mm -hmm. So you literally live with this, this person for the duration of the research and the writing of a book. Mm -hmm. And what has always happened to me, uh, as I think happens with many writers, is when the book is done, it's in the can. It's in the publisher's hands. Mm -hmm. And I get the finished product. I look at the cover. I might flip through the pages, and that's it. I, I, don't, I don't look at the book again. It's done. Yeah. I could not do that with this book. I could not do that with this book. This was a much greater challenge because – 
I had to try to get inside Taylor's head as much as I possibly could. And the only way to do that was to talk with his parents and his siblings and his friends, just the same with, with Rob. And, and these are living people. Yeah. And especially when you meet face to face and you interview, those are very difficult because those interviews, you have got to be very sensitive. You got to take your lead from the person you're interviewing. And even though you might want to press forward with your questions, you got to understand when you can't do that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when you can, uh, and as I said, again, I was so fortunate that people trusted me and, you know, w- without that trust, this book would not have happened. And the second part of that is that you and your father, uh, and Denise Garibaldi were very generous in asking me to continue to be part mm-hmm. of in the Garibaldi case, the foundation they started for, for Rob, in your case, the mm-hmm. Taylor Hooten Foundation. Uh, and, and I have done things because I believe so strongly in, 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 in what you're doing. And if I'm going on a podcast, I've also done in-person uh, speaking on this topic well, I go back through that. I read that book before I go on a podcast. <laughs> I read it cover to cover again and again and again. And it still evokes the same kind of feelings. I think the, 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 the biggest compliment really is a, is a writer you can get is when your book gets transferred to an audio book, because that means there's really a demand for it. Mm-hmm. And it's going to reach a wider audience because there's a lot of people who don't like to read print Mm -hmm. but they like to listen and that was the very first book that i'd ever written that went to audiobook and you could still get it on audible if you just click in audible since then and and i credit that book with doing this too i've written uh three other books they're all on audio so and and that that book started it so that book has had a tremendous impact on my life as a parent, as a teacher, coach, and as a writer. So when the end user picks up your book or they get the audio book, so when people read Suicide Squeeze, what do you want them to take away from the book? The first and foremost thing I want them to understand, and I, I say this in the introduction and you know, in, the, in the conclusion, the greatest resource that our country has is our young people. And, and, and our generation, the generations that precede them, have an obligation to raise those kids in a healthy, constructive, and yes, morally sound way. And that's not just for those of us who were, you know, the, the moms, the dads, the teachers, the coaches. That also means professional athletes, whether if we like it or not, younger kids look up to and they look for role models. Taylor's role model was Alex Rodriguez. Yes, it was. And what a disappointment he ended up being for yeah. Taylor. Uh, Rob Garibaldi's uh, role, model, role models were Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds. And what disappointments they ended up being, especially Mark McGuire, who conducted himself with such class during that 1998 home run race uh, for the single season record with Sammy Sosa, you know, to do that and then to go before Congress and refuse on the grounds that might incriminate him. And then saying repeatedly that he was only there to talk about the future and not the past Mm -hmm. when he knew darn well that what Congress was concerned about was the past and the present is unconscionable, absolutely unconscionable. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first point that I, that I wanted to register that our young people are our nation's most valuable natural resource. And we owe it to them to give them a good upbringing and good role models. The second thing that I really 
want to emphasize in that book. And I'm sure the numbers are greater now because at the time that that book was written, there were 1.5 million young people who were using steroids. Mm -hmm. And the number was growing then. Yeah. And, and this is a health epidemic. People don't want to admit that. It is. You're right. It is. And unfortunately, the, the youth leagues don't have the kind of monitoring that they should have. And the coaches in the schools don't even sit down and talk to their student athletes and the parents about this danger. And even though Major League Baseball now has drug testing and the minor leagues have drug testing, uh, some conferences do, to my knowledge, college conferences. But to my knowledge, Division One is still the biggest offenders, you know, in, in, in this front. And high schools and increasingly powerhouse high schools, I don't know what, you know, if you have four or five A as the top in Texas – here in Pennsylvania, it's 4A, but the powerhouse schools like that, you can't tell me that they're not abusing, at the very least, supplements, nutritional supplements. It's certainly And, and that's got to be changed. And even if it is, to my understanding, there is still not an effective, effective testing method that can pick up all the different types of steroids that there are. Yeah. And even more dangerous, when these kids cycle through and they try to get off of it, off of the steroids, they spiral down into a depression. And if you take antidepressants and you mix it with steroids, and unless you know, the worse. situation has changed, that's a deadly combination. Yeah, make it worse. And, so, that, and that's the, that's, Bill, I mean, that's the important, I, that's why I'm so glad we're talking. One, I mean, they have access to this book to read, but it's so important that we continue to educate Educate, educate, because that's the best part of prevention. You know, like you said, testing's expensive. Major League Baseball has the best drug testing policy in all of professional sports. But Major League Baseball is a multi-billion dollar organization. A local high school couldn't afford, you know, what, what they're paying to test some of these athletes. So it's important that, you know, this message is getting sent to our young people, not just our young people but our adult influencers that are within our schools that can influence these young people and they can give them the right knowledge and, and, and no longer say you need to get bigger, stronger, faster. And if you do say that, be prepared with our young people today to follow up with a nutrition plan, a weightlifting plan, something to follow up with them because Bill, as you know, I mean, being around young people, I mean, they are looking, uh, some of them are looking for the, the fastest point between A and B. And they're going to find this information on the internet if we're not providing them with the real information and the facts. And that, and that's really, I think, the last point that I wanted to, to, to emphasize. It's actually really a combination of two that um, legally, unless things have changed in the last three years, uh, steroids are a Schedule Three substance. They should be Schedule One. Yeah. You know, and 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 the prison time for the people who sell this stuff should be extensive You're if right. it's going to stop. And I say that, I say that because, you know, you referred to the fact that, you know, the major leaguers were using it and they had the best, uh, you know, training available to them and the best that, well, they also had the pure steroids, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the kids, they don't know what they're doing. They mm -hmm. don't know how to cycle. And th they were using, you know, both in Rob's and in Taylor's case, they were, they were ex uh, exploiting steroids that were based with horse urine or Crisco. Yep. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's dangerous in of itself. You're right. You know, they don't have the money to, you know, to, uh, to purchase what the major leaguers were using. Mm -mm. That, that, yeah. <laughs> You know, it, 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 something's got to change here. You're right. Something's got to change. You're right. And I think this is, you know, like my dad always says, this is going to be a battle fought for many, many, many years to come. And, uh, you know, that's why that's why we believe, obviously, this podcast is important. The book's important. It, it's just we need to keep talking about this topic. Yeah. 
Unquestionably. So, so what kind of reactions have you gotten as an author from those who've read Suicide Squeeze? Uh, threat of a lawsuit from one place, um, <laughs> one of the schools I'm not going to go into, but one yeah. of the schools that was uh, mentioned because it played a very uh, instrumental role in uh, in this book. Mm-hmm. So a threat of a lawsuit from uh, them, a lot of blowback from bodybuilders yeah. who told me that I was all wet and I didn't know a damn thing about steroids and that steroids uh cannot do the harm that uh, you know i insist that it does mm-hmm. um unfortunately most of the feedback was negative mm-hmm. it was an attack on what uh i had written uh but that you know you, you, you learn how to get a very tough skin if you're a writer and what has meant more to me is the positive feedback from parents, teacher Mm -hmm. coaches who thanked me for writing the book, who have made it in some school districts required reading for the parents of student athletes and for some student athletes. Uh, So those, those are the rewarding things for me. I could care less what the bodybuilders say. I could care less what professional athletes say. Yeah. I could care less what the institution is threatened to sue me. Exactly. Says. You know, I, you know. I think I, I'm a silver linings guy, right? And at the end of the day, if you've got people that are saying nasty things, especially from the bodybuilding community, one, the positive thing is they picked up the book and they read it. That's right. Two, you know, it's always what, when you're doing good, evil will always try to combat you. And if evil combats you, you know you're doing the right thing. It is making an impact because they're talking about the book. They're reading the book. Thus, more people are becoming educated and aware of the problem. That's right. So, Bill, I want to talk, you know, as we wrap up here, where can people go to find Suicide Squeeze if they'd like to purchase it or download uh, an audio version? Well, the, the audio book is on Audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E. Uh, you just type that into a search engine and you type my name and, and all the books, starting with Suicide Squeeze uh, that I've done that have gone on audio are on there. So that's, that's one way to do it. The easiest way to do it is to go on my website. All you do is type in my name, William C. Cachetis, K A S. H A T U S on any search engine, you'll come up with my website. You go to the books page on the menu, uh, scroll down and hit on the icon book cover of Suicide Squeeze and all the ordering information and hot links to Audible and to Temple University Press, the publisher of the book, uh, can be found there. And then last resort, just, um, Google Amazon Books, uh, type in the title of the book, and you can order it off of Amazon. Um, I know that uh, when it first came out, and actually for about two years after, uh, the Barnes & Noble booksellers were, were carrying the book. But, you know, they what they tend to do is after two years, uh, if it goes into paperback and it's selling, you know, like hotcakes, they'll put the paperback out. Um, but what they usually try to do is they stay more current with an author's book. If an author, you know, writes several books. Uh, so, you know, books that I've written in 219 now are, are at Barnes and Nobles. Uh, but you could still get the book online. Perfect. And I'll be sure to place a link to all of these in the show notes. Anybody listening, you can go out, look at the show notes and, and find links out to these books. But Bill, before I let you go, one of the most popular parts of the All Me podcast is the last section of questions, which we call our curveball questions. It's one of the hardest balls in baseball to hit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you these questions. Just whatever comes to mind first, just go with it. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So what is your spirit animal? Like the animal who you most find yourself similar in personality with? Deer. A deer. Okay. Yep. Any, re- any reason? Deer is very quiet and 
observes everything around the environment before he acts. I love that. Okay. If you could travel back in time to any period in history, what would be the time in history you'd like to go back and see and be part of? August of 1862 in Washington, D.C., uh, visiting with Abraham Lincoln on the cusp of deciding whether he's going to init- uh, he is going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I love that too, because uh, th- these questions obviously are tailored specifically to you. So I was anxious to hear what time uh, in history you'd go back to. Final question. I- I'm I'm really excited to hear this answer. There's a dinner table set for three people. Okay. One seat is yours. The other two seats you can fill with any two people in the world, past or present. Who are the two people you're going to have dinner with? That's easy. That's easy. Rob and Taylor, unquestionably. Of all the people I've ever written about, I, I have such strong feelings for them that I would really, really love to talk with them and say, why, Yeah, you know, why knowing what you know now? Yeah. I mean, that, that might sound, um, somewhat patronizing on a podcast like this. No. Uh, or it might sound as if, wow, out of all the figures in history, because there are, I mean, there are many figures. I mean, I'd love to sit down with Lincoln. I'd love to sit down with Jesus Christ. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to sit down with Mary Jo Kopechny, who I wrote a book about, but mm-hmm. none of them, none of them evoke the questions that Rob and Taylor evoke. Yeah. And I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher who cares about kids. Um, and I'd love to know why they did what they did and what they would change now knowing how it ended out, ended up. You know, I, I, I'm one, as many people know, if you know me personally, I, I'm full of words. I, I'm really at a loss for words. That, that wasn't what I expected. I was thinking of Jesus Christ or an Abraham Lincoln, but that's, I love that. And I, I love your response to that. But Bill, I again, I can't thank you enough. It has just been great knowing you, becoming friends, keeping in touch with you. I'm so glad that we're, we still keep our relationship up. I just really, you know, respect your work, especially having the opportunity to interview with you. It's a time in my life that for as long as I live, as long as I guess I'm mentally uh, able to remember things, uh, I'll never forget that day at McFadden's. I'll never forget the first time I picked up that book, and I'll never forget closing the cover saying, wow, that was very well written. It was easy to understand. Uh, You just did a great job with it. Well, I thank you. I thank you for those kind words, Donald. Um, the feelings are, are mutual. Uh, and, you know, say, say hi to your mom, your dad, and Mackenzie for me. i uh, just so fortunate for many things in life, but one of the things that I will never forget is the trust, the kindness, and the affection that your family has shown me. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. We appreciate you being on the All Me podcast. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.